Mitchell and I'm the director of the Tasmania branch of the Australia Institute and I'm going to host today. I'm filling in for Ebony who is the usual hostess for the um, our webinar series but she's on a very well deserved break on the north on the south coast of New South Wales. Uh, I'm coming from, to you from Nipaluna Hobart, Lutrawita, Tasmania, uh, home of the Palana Pakoa people and I'd like to start by acknowledging um, Lutrawita as their land and that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so we do these webinars each week during the pandemic, although the times do change. Um, so we do actually take these seminars, webinars, and send them out to everybody who's on this list afterwards. Uh, so now that I've had that small technical difficulty overcome, I'll go back to letting you know that if you do want to know the webinars that we've got coming up, please um, log on to tai.org.au forward slash webinar and get on the email list and we'll let you know what's coming, what's coming up. All right, we've now, we're now getting up to around the 1500 mark of participants. Today's webinar has proved to be one of our most popular. Um, and I will hand over to Richie Merzian, who will introduce our guest and outline the next hour. Thanks, Leanne. And uh, thank you, Craig, for joining us here. No, uh, so before we kick things off, Craig, I thought I'd, I'd just start by just painting the picture of where we're at on climate as a, a short summary. Uh, because climate change is a really tough issue, and I think it's particularly tough in Australia. It's been 30 years since Australia signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and taken on multiple commitments to reduce its emissions. But really, since then, emissions have actually increased. And the next climate agreement, the Paris Agreement, which operates over the next 10 years, will only be met, according to the Australian government, by left using these leftover carbon credits that it accrued from the previous climate agreements that don't represent real emissions reductions. And then they'll use it to offset or avoid reducing emissions going forward. And that's problematic because Australia is one of the world's largest greenhouse gas, emit gas emitters in the top 20 in the world. And that's not including what it exports. So it, it, as the show explored, uh, Australia is responsible for about 500 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions per annum, it exports more than twice that in the coal and gas that it sends overseas to be consumed um, in our trading partners. And so Australia has this oversized carbon footprint and the only approach that the government is offering right now is a technology roadmap without a particular destination and without a clear indication for how it will tail that down. 15 years ago, we were talking about clean coal that was burying emissions underground. Uh, that hasn't worked. We don't have a single working CCS facility for coal. Now we're talking about clean hydrogen, which is using the same kind of technology uh, and hoping for a different result. So overall, it's quite a dire picture, but one that your show has managed to find a way to communicate without all the doom and gloom that often happens when you talk about climate change in this country. So Fight for Planet A was a three-part doco. It looked at our energy emissions, our transport emissions, uh, our food emissions, and explored what people can do in that personal action, that personal capacity. One thing we're hoping to do today, Craig, is explore that a bit further, not just what people can do individually, but also what they can do politically. Uh, because if most of our emissions are in things that are outside our immediate control in terms of what we consume and what we drive, what we eat, then how do we actually address the overall picture as well as the immediate one in front of us? And so maybe that's where we'll, we'll, we'll kick things off um, with a, a question and of course uh, welcome to open with anything you like as well but how did you find that balance between empowering people making it accessible for people to, to engage in climate change and the personal actions they could take forward um, whilst also balancing the broader political space where a lot of the decisions made at that higher level are driving Australia's oversized emissions yeah, it was a really hard balance, and I, I hopefully for anyone who's uh, watched. By the way, I'm just I'm coming from the Gadigal, uh, from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to recognise the 
um, elders, both past and present. <clears throat> um, it was a big balance. And for anyone who hasn't seen the show, uh, you can watch it on iView. Uh, it would be wrong to suggest that we only suggested personal changes as the only way. We talked about gas companies. We talked about our electricity grids. We talked about government action and all those kind of things as well. <clears throat> but there's a couple of reasons that we did look at personal change. And there's, there's, there's several reasons, to be honest, for that. One of the reasons was that in doing a lot of research for this show, I think there's a realisation that there's a, a great deal of misunderstanding about climate change and about the causes of it. And, you know, you'd see polling suggesting, for instance, that <clears throat> people asked about what are you doing to stop climate change? They'd say, well, I don't take plastic bags from coals or woolies. Important issue, important waste issue, obviously ties into war and waste and that kind of stuff. That's an important thing, but that's obviously not a big mover and shaker when it comes to actual carbon emissions. Um, so one of the problems we face when kind of talking about policy and one of the reasons that I think our politics can be so clouded when it comes to election time, you can say you're going to steal the weekend, is that there's obviously if you don't have a lot of understanding within the broader population, it makes it a lot easier to bullshit the population. <clears throat> so part of it is actually about getting that base understanding to start with. Now, that understanding comes a lot easier if you start with things that people understand. If you start with people that people think engage with it on, a, on a daily basis, <clears throat> the number of times I try to think of a really simple way to communicate the complexity of the electricity grid in Australia and failed, you know, <laughs> is overwhelming. So you really do need to look at it from a perspective where people can understand it. I think that's the first thing is that uh, getting an understanding of where the problem comes from and seeing where you contribute to it is, is part of that, but also showing <clears throat> that you can actually get a solution, you can actually be part of the solution is, is the second thing. There's a second step to that though. If you start engaging with your own footprint, you start looking at it, you will start hitting a lot of walls. You hit a great deal of walls. Uh, I hit walls all the time when I try to reduce my footprint and that walls will go, oh, the reason that wall is there is because government or another actor is not doing anything to change, despite the fact they may be saying they are doing something. <clears throat> so it's also about saying, you undertake this personal action and see how far you get before you run into a wall that's been put there by a lack of government action. And that comes up quite often in these things. A third thing I would say, and this is probably the depressing part of it. And by the way, thanks for saying there's no doom or gloom. I thought there was plenty of doom and gloom in it, Richie. The third part about it, and this is actually depressing, is that put aside all that stuff about you know, everything about how we're going to change people's behaviour and how that will change how they engage with the issue and how it will change whether they engage politically or otherwise. We have been so goddamn terrible in this country at reducing our emissions. If you look at how much we, you know, <clears throat> so last year, we actually had a reduction in emissions. We've gone down three times in the last six years. Uh, so we've kind of gone up and down over the last few years. We've moved almost nowhere in terms of reduction in emissions. So last year when the government was saying, hey, look, we're so freaking great, we've done some reductions. We're talking about 5 million tonnes of CO2 equivalents. Now, in Australia, we have nearly 10 million households. <clears throat> Getting half of those households to cut a tonne off their, off their carbon footprint is actually bloody easy. It's really simple. I mean, probably... To be honest, if everyone just signed up to green power, you'd probably do it overnight. <clears throat> and that would have flow and effects in terms of the grid as well. So sadly, when people say, well, individual action can't do anything. In Australia, the bar has been set so goddamn low that individual action can do things. Now, that's I'm, I'm not saying that we should then only rely on individual action because obviously we have a much bigger challenge ahead of us that needs it. But yeah, in Australia, it's so goddamn frustrating that individual action can make a difference, which is terribly sad in some ways <laughs> given how much more power government has to affect change and business as well can so I, that would be my summary of the answer to your question i um just to jump in quickly for a second i've been taking questions for the past few days online craig and um, a lot of them are around uh, what personal action can be taken <clears throat> you know we've got um, one woman called Tina, her son it was so inspired. She, he's made a whole feature length film in five minute parts called Now in capitals. Um, but we've got another lady, Shirley from the Blue Mountains, who um, she actually, her question was, she would like to know from you what, what you're proudest of in terms of changing your own personal um, footprint and what you think you have to do better, in, better on. Yeah, well, uh, I guess I'm proudest. When I was looking at this, I was proudest that I 
you know, I, I kind of got into green energy so many years ago and have been doing it for years. <clears throat> also been slowly over time trying to increase things like solar and reduce that kind of thing. I'd say probably electricity uh, is where I'm a little bit better. I'm not great on the food front. I am, and uh, you know, I, <laughs> I am not a vegetarian, <laughs> despite the fact that I'm very much trying to limit my red meat consumption. Um, you don't and look transport like you eat too much. Thank you. Yeah. I only drink beer during COVID. Uh, but uh, transport's a tough one. And transport's an interesting one, actually, because it, I found it was an area where you re it's one of those ones where I, I feel like you hit the wall of government in action a lot sooner uh, than in some of the other areas. So, yeah, that's one where I, I kind of tussle with it. I have uh, good months and bad. So, yeah, look, <clears throat> it's a journey. It's not an overnight thing. And this is the process. And it's also... I'm not calling for perfection from anyone. Uh, it's, it's about everyone. You know, we want to make it more accessible that everyone realizes they can do something. Even if you can't get to, you know, zero carbon, you can actually make a difference. Um, trans transport is a good one to explore because it is somewhere where the government has no policy around incentivizing low emission vehicles. There's no fuel standards to reduce That's emissions. That's an outrage, Rich Richie. The governments over the last 10, 15 years have released at least five discussion papers. And these are very powerful discussion papers. They involve a lot of discussion. But we're discussing we're right now. the same thing that they discussed years ago, and then there's nothing about it. Do you not understand the power of discussion paper technology, Richie? How dare you talk down? Uh, if only discussion papers brought down emissions, we'd be leading yeah, exactly. the world the sound of it. Uh, well, it, ju it just so happens that today is a World Electric Vehicle Day. And one of my favorite bits, hands down, from the show, Craig, was when you jumped into a Tesla Model S and then drag raced a Holden supercar and just demolished, demolished it and, and left a whole bunch of rev heads kind of slack jawed, uh, staring and wondering what the future was going to look like. Um, what can we do to accelerate the uptake of electric vehicles? In the absence of any policies, lots of discussion papers, but absence of any policies or anything in the transport sector, mm -hmm. and what I think less than 1% of new car sales being EVs right now. Yeah, it's really hard, this one. And so firstly, just in terms of that drag race, I would say that the David Sultana, the guy that we drag race, was actually fantastic about it. You can see his actual excitement at seeing, you know, the next step. Like afterwards, he's like, I want to get one of these Teslas. And he's probably got a lot better chance of buying one than I do. So, uh, you know, so, you know, it was interesting to see that interaction. But I, I mean, I actually, I did that partly because I wanted to, to respond to the kind of ridiculousness of, you know, that you went, Australia likes cars with grunt, <clears throat> but also because I wanted to sneak in the graphic showing charging electric car off the grid because it's a really good question it's often asked it's often asked as a kind of haha i'm going to get you here you know but what if you're charging your, your electric car off the grid because it's all the coal in the grid isn't it just as bad as petrol cars now it's better than petrol cars but it's still not as good as it could be and that shows again how our electricity grid is such a problem so that's the reason why i wanted to do that uh, as well as the enjoyment or fear of um, <laughs> drag racing a tesla <clears throat> but yeah it's, it's interesting this is one where i find that you do have a real problem with um and i think it's a bit of a chicken and egg argument so let's put aside the federal government for a second we do have state governments and councils who seem to be trying to engage with the issue of electric cars but the chicken and egg for them is going well there's so few people with electric cars why would i put you know infrastructure why would i put an electric char car charger out and about and the people who are going well why would i buy an electric car charger because <clears throat> there's no charges around i mean me personally i have no austrian parking I had talked to, I did talk to my council about whether it was legal to drape, you know, charges across the pavement. They didn't seem to think it was a great idea. But um, so you've got that first chicken and egg problem, which is that, you know, we don't have the infrastructure, so you don't, you know, less likely to invest in an electric car. You have the second chicken and egg problem, which is that right now, if you look at countries overseas like Norway, there's a massive waiting list for electric cars. It's a huge waiting list. And a lot of countries that actually have proper electric car policies have waiting lists to get electric cars. So why would you as an Australian car manufacturer bring electric cars into a country that has almost <clears throat> no you know, demand for them? It's really the reason why Tesla's kind of leads is that they only have electric cars so that they kind of respond to that. So it's, it's frustrating because I think we really do need positive policies in that and i and i think councils can do it like i do think state governments and councils working together to kind of go hey 
let's look at Sydney or whatever. Let's start putting the infrastructure in place to make it so people go, oh, you know, I could be charging my electric car here or it's, you know, to overcome that fear of range anxiety is, <clears throat> is a big part of it. Um, and I also just, I do want to say, I think one, one fault of the show, if I can criticize my own show <laughs> is, and we, we didn't, we weren't able to just because of time constraints and money and all that. I would have liked to also have given some families a hybrid car as well, because in terms of currently, if you look at <clears throat> emissions, of cars in Australia, if you go to Green Vehicle Guide and you look at that kind of stuff, in terms of life cycle emissions, a lot of the hybrid cars that are out there now are going to be probably the lowest cars you can take. They're also a lot more accessible, a lot cheaper. We've seen uh, recently kind of massive, I think is it 80% of RAVs are now being sold through Toyota uh, hybrid cars. And that, you know, it's not, it's not getting rid of those emissions, but in terms of current steps now, it's a really positive step in terms of reducing emissions. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, even in countries like Sweden and, you know, Norway and that, most of those countries still have a higher take up of plug-in hybrids, rather, Norway has battery hybrids, the others have a high take up of plug-in hybrids. So even for those people saying, oh, a bit of range anxiety, I'm a bit worried if I run out of charge, you go, well, plug-in hybrids are another option and they do exist in Australia. So there are other options out there and it doesn't, mm. it doesn't just have to be battery powered electric vehicles as the solution. You can look at other solutions that are currently there now, but it really does need, I mean, for us to make that next step really needs a bit of positive government action and whether that's at a state level or council level, I don't know. But uh, yeah, if you're waiting for that, and again, Richie, you shouldn't be critical of the federal government level because they did put in windscreen stickers in, I think, 2001, was it? And that's been a very effective policy. It's interesting to, to compare windscreen stickers versus mandatory policies that Europe put in. I mean, the jury's still out on which is more successful. <laughs> Actually, um, we've got another question from Steve Gill along those lines of government action. It's a little bit um, leading. He said, if you factor in all of the state government and council activities, does that basically make the federal government useless and relevant? So I think no, we know what, it does. what Steve's no, look, opinion what it does. Yeah, well, <laughs> at the moment it's kind of is a bit, but the problem is that the federal government still has so much capacity to, to make the change. And that's... Hmm. <clears throat> realistically right now it's not a question of climate denial even at the it was interesting seeing the response to the show it see how the debate has changed there's very little kind of climate denial response to that it's it's climate delay it's about delaying change and so if you're hypothetically speaking an energy minister in the federal government you can you can just slow things down by not you know by just slowing down change and that's what's happening at the moment but unfortunately if we had somebody really proactive in that particular role you could make so many positive changes and, and a good example of that as you mentioned is norway we, we have some research coming out through our nordic policy center um, that just shows that norway has just agreed to a hundred percent electric vehicle target for all new car sales by 2025 and that's not including plug-ins so in the next five years every car sold will be electric they're at 50% now for electric with an additional 20% mm. for plug-in. Yeah. And all of that has been driven by policies. Like their first mm. policy came into place in 1990. Um, yeah. And that's stuff like waiving stamp duty, you know, decreasing retro, allowing them to ride bus lanes, get free parking, you know, mandatory charging stations every 50 kilometers. So even though like there is that range anxiety and they have an average commute that's larger than Australia's average commute, people see those charging stations and they have that confidence because the government took those leading steps. So I think there is a lot the federal government can do, but there's no point in waiting, um, especially now that they've opened up the ability to import secondhand cars now more easily. So I think we'll yeah. probably, hopefully see more secondhand EVs come through the market too. Yeah. And that's totally true. This is where it needs the policy to guide it because it needs to get some kind of tipping point. We're nowhere near that in Australia. And it's interesting mm -hmm. when I was dealing with the kind of <clears throat> the young household of, guys in Wollongong who are all students and mm. like realistically I was like I can't do anything for you you know you you you, you shouldn't it's no, no responsibility on you you've got your old parents secondhand cars and old cheap secondhand cars of course you can't be asked to make mm. a change other than trying to use them less <clears throat> but if we actually had that kind of policy whereby at the moment we were having a lot of the first-hand cars that were being bought by the people who had the money then that was that has a flow-on effect it means that mm -hmm. 10 years from now, the student cars of the future are so electric cars. We just don't have that at the moment. So it really does need some kind of proactive policy on that front. And, and, and this is the interesting thing is that, it, again, uh, people are fearful of this. And there's a, if you go to the, you know, there's still 
four wheel drives in Norway. There are still these kind of things being sold in Norway. You know, you have to, it's not just, there's a lot of carrot involved in this. There's a lot of just promoting positive changes and to the benefit of, of, of those that actually take it up. So yeah, look, people I know who have gone to electric swear they'd never go back. Uh, we just got to get to the point where we actually get close to a tipping point. So, Craig, moving on to the question of gas, the, the Minister for Emissions Reductions and Energy is talking about a gas-fired recovery, which seems to run counter to a lot of the research uh, that you presented in the show. And we were fortunate enough to feed some of that research in, in the context of one gas site in WA, Chevron's Gorgon site, and their inability to bury three years worth of of emissions, um, well, they should have been burying about 80% of that, have not buried any of it. That was equivalent to Australia's annual domestic aviation emissions in one year, like 10 million mm. tons that they did bury. And apparently now the solution to COVID is, is, to, is to line up more of our gas resources uh, and to keep going. Like, is yeah. this a path we should be taking? No, it's nuts. Okay, so it's nuts. And let's 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 actually let's take it from a different perspective. Though. Like the irony of it is that Chevron's Gorgon plant is the best standard we have in Australia right now because now their carbon capture, the only having spent you know countless billions on carbon capture technology through Australia, generally coming to nothing over the many years. We actually have this plant that has some level of carbon capture and storage. It's not all of it. It's, you know, it's game was about 40%. <clears throat> I'm still not entirely clear if they're hitting that. It doesn't seem that they're hitting that, but they're actually capturing some of it, right? So they're the gold standard right now in Australia. Now you would think that if that was the case, that new gas LNG plants that were going to be built in Australia would at least go for that standard, but that's not the case. We required this of, in the like 2000s when this was going through to get approval, we require this level. Right now, 15 years later, when we're facing this, all the challenges that we've already seen from climate change, we're seeing fires throughout Australia, all these other problems, we're not even requiring that level of new gas plants. So let's, let's, let, let me put it to uh, the Minister for Emissions Reductions. If you want to have a gas fuelled recovery, why don't you say, okay, all gas plants have to be you know, 100% offset or 80% offset. I'll even take that. And then look at the price of that and then look at the cost of that and compare it to the fact that already they're being beaten by um by by gas by gas by sorry by wind and solar they're already being beaten by cost so if you you know the problem is that this is the ridiculousness of it is that everybody argued for you know gas and coal because it was the cheapest and now it's not the cheapest they're still arguing for it but they're saying we should subsidize it I'm not against subsidies but the reason you subsidize something is you subsidize something that is a benefit to society and it is not increasing our emissions massively. And yeah, reality is sinking money more in money into gas seems nuts. I mean, it's, there's a chance it becomes a stranded asset. You know, if, if Europe takes the next step and starts to, you know, put kind of trade barriers against countries that have high carbon emissions, Australia's going to be screwed. So it, it doesn't make sense on so many levels. And, and I mean, look, there's a lot of data around about this, but it's, it's also... It's a highly capital intensive industry. So generally speaking, that means it's going to be really slow to actually get a change. And also the high capital intensive industries generally have low jobs numbers as well. So it doesn't make sense on so many levels. And it's very frustrating to see that being championed as a policy. I mean, that said, I understand that if you put a room full of gas executives together and ask them how to solve a problem, maybe they choose gas. I mean, shit. You know, that's, uh, it is almost crazy. like the um, economic recovery task force is being led by a whole heap of people with gas interests. It's almost like that. Almost. Like almost. That. But yeah, look, it's just this is the thing is that, you know, in Fire for Planet A, we didn't say don't extract gas. I mean, obviously, that's a valid argument. But the point is this, that, that, that you have to cover the externalities that you're creating. You have to cover the costs that you're creating. Like if, if, if somebody said to us, we need a gas fueled recovery. And to do that, we're going to make sure that gas companies can pump lead and benzene and all these other chemicals into the ocean and into the atmosphere because we need these jobs. Everyone will kick up an enormous fuss. Why the hell do we accept that if they, kick up, if they put massive amounts of methane and CO2 into the atmosphere, that that's an acceptable level? You know, this is it. I'm willing to ask people to make changes in their own life, that kind of thing. But these companies have a much bigger attitude footprint than any of us and they can make changes and they've got the money to do it 
so look, it, it's a ridiculous situation that we face. And you're quite right. Just we did back in the envelope uh, analysis that shows that you could invest in any other sector of the economy for the same amount of money and create more jobs than you could the gas industry. It is so capital intensive versus jobs intensive that, 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 that anything, you throw money in any direction and you'll make more jobs. Richie, this is very concerning that the Australian Institute is using the back of an envelope. I think you should be using much better technology and you, know, you, should, you should use a spreadsheet at the very least. Oh, well, this, this is part of recycling though, isn't it? Isn't that part of the solution to climate change? <laughs> Um, I'm using a second hand envelope. We did, we did use a spreadsheet to work out the full size of Australia's gas reserves and resources. And if we did take a gas fired recovery and lit all of that up as industry recommend we do, what would be the global annual emissions um, worth of, of burning that? And that research should be coming out tomorrow. So we have used some spreadsheets as well. So Good, to Good to see. Good to see. There are. Oh, sorry, Richie, just quickly, because there, there's been a lot of questions. I should have mentioned at the beginning, too, to um, guests that if you hover over the little Q&A um, icon at the bottom, you can ask questions. But there are quite a lot there from people who are asking around influence and when it comes to lobbying for change for the government, um, and they're interested to hear both Richie and Craig's ideas on, on what, can, what can be done by individuals. Yeah, we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll jump into that one. There's no shortage of, uh, of, of uh, ways that we can yeah. tackle government. But I was going to quickly just jump in on, on food, Craig, because you, you visited mm. Mark Wooten's um, <coughs> cattle farm and he put mm -hmm. sustainability front and centre, but I guess he's exceptional in that regard. But the, on the plus side, though, you have you know, a younger generation that is more conscious of the health impacts, of the climate impacts of their food, um, is food an area where we could see a far greater impact being made because um, because you have that consciousness building and because it is immediately within your grasp to change? I want to say yes, but I, I don't. I don't think so. <clears throat> it's fascinating. Look, food is a really tough one. Um, We've had a lot of focus on, you know, the climate impact of food for a lot of years. And it's an area where people are really resistant to change. <clears throat> and I think at the moment, it's not really in the hands of consumers because you don't have that information at, when you go to a shop. Mm -hmm. it, 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 to, even get, to even get the level of information we had for the show, to even compare several different foods you know beer and <laughs> beer and beef and chicken and kangaroo and all these kind of things was an absolute goddamn nightmare and i know that tesco in the uk actually did try to i think about 10 15 years ago try to put carbon footprints on food and kind of weren't followed by others and kind of fell over in the end so i think that look yes in terms of your own personal footprint it is one of the easiest ways you can obviously change that footprint. You know, we were surprised. Like we kind of, a lot of people said to us, don't do food because people hate being told what to eat. The reason we did it in the end was because A, there's a lot of interesting solutions coming through and B, when we looked at the individual footprints of families, in some cases, it was actually bigger than their transport or, you know, it was the number two there. So it was actually a way to affect change quite quickly. And also because methane, one of, the, one of the reasons this is important is because a large part of the food footprint is methane. And methane is always talked about as being about 20 to 30 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas. But that's if you're looking at it on a 100 year time scale. If you're looking at it on a kind of 10, 20 year time scale, it's like 80 times more powerful. So it's actually, in terms of getting bang for buck through your change, immediately it has a lot more of an impact so yeah i think it's look it's it's very positive from a personal perspective you can make changes and to a point and get that change straight away overall i don't feel like it's going to be the, the, the easiest way to get changed because a lot of information isn't there because even the mark wooten example <clears throat> there's very few examples of you know meat and livestock australia is saying that they'll be carbon neutral by 2030 fascinated to watch that i really am fascinated to see that and if we can get those kind of movements the fact that they're saying they're going to do that will have a big impact but realistically in terms of the quicker change you can get like you know australia has such capacity to 
have renewable energy on a massive scale, which will bring down electricity prices long term as well, which should you know, help a lot of other things. You know, that's the that's the low hanging fruit as far as I'm concerned in Australia. That that kind of food is uh, food. I think is a tricky one. Tricky one. Yeah. As much as I'd love to just say yes to that question. No, I think I think you, you nailed it there. Um, in terms of uh, um. In terms of the disconnect that your show revealed around people's understanding of Australia's role, Australia's emissions, per capita emissions, um, why do you think there is that disconnect? Um, because it's not just an, you know, a, sort of a tangential question. Like This impacts people directly. Most people are invested in Australia's resources sector through their superannuation investments that haven't done well over the last 10 years, if you track them closely, like people are directly impacted by Australia's emissions and its choices, um, but seem to not really be aware of its role in the whole climate space. Why do you think that is? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think it's, <clears throat> it comes back to that kind of whole thing about CO2 and pollution. And, and then people think of Australia as being a very clean country. You know, you, you see, vision of Mumbai and the pollution there and therefore you kind of you think oh we're a lot cleaner than that so that kind of visible pollution is I think where people are responding to and that's the interesting trick about CO2 and about greenhouse gases is that they're invisible as Tony Abbott said um, so uh, you know that that's part of the problem I think is that people think of us as being an environmentally quite positive nation which is interesting and we are in some factors but a lot of factors are really bad and and you know in Australia yeah, a lot of people were shocked that Australia is one of the high, particularly if you do it per, per capita, we just, it's amazing how, like, it's very hard to find nations that are worse than us, actually, when we're looking at this, like, half of the oil states are worse than us, too, like, yeah. it's like, or are better than us as well, like, we are really up the top there. Uh, and, you know, there's so many factors involved in that, but the main one is our electricity, you know, how we create electricity. And by the way, to go to your first point, Richie, that was not us including any of the exports. We were looking at the domestic pollution. And that's where, you know, things like LNG have a big footprint here, but have a bigger footprint when sent somewhere else as well. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a real surprise to people. And, and, the, and the thing is that we're, we're bigger than, you know, we're not only bigger per capita. Like, we're in the, as you say, the top 20, although... God, I can oh. never find the exact figure. And exact, there, there, there are so many different ones yeah. there. There are 40 but, but, countries with bigger populations than yeah. us that have smaller carbon footprints just for domestic emissions. UK is a great example of it. I mean, the United Kingdom has a smaller emissions, even though it has like two and a half times our population. So it's frustrating. Uh, it's a very frustrating position to be in. And look, it's, but I think it's important because the, the rhetoric that's been used very powerfully by government over the years to kind of play down any importance in our action in Australia is to suggest that we have <clears throat> no impact, we're small, we're 1.3%, that kind of thing. And it's really important for Australians to realise, no, when it, you know, we are a massive part of the footprint. We have a massive capacity to affect change. Um, and even beyond that, even if you were just, even if you were tiny, Australia is so impacted by climate change. You know, Australia is a country that will be hit by fires and droughts and be affected by these kind of things. We need to be one of the countries who's at the forefront of change so that we can be out there telling others they need to change rather than being the, the ones dragging us back every time we go to a climate change thing. So, yeah, look, it's, it's a frustrating position to be in. Leanne, did you want to go to go to the... Do you want some more questions now? Yeah, sure. I'll just go down and have a look at what's coming up. Um, I think one of the things while I'm looking that um, interests me about the UK as well is that it's a country like ours. I mean, it's not like ours, but the lifestyle, it's a developed economy. So when I watched the show, I actually watched it on iView last night. I did a quick um, binge watch of the three episodes. And to me, people look surprised when, particularly when, um, you know, you said that the UK had less emissions per capita than what Australia did. Um, some people are asking around the food. There's a lot of questions on food. And some people are suggesting that we need to do two things. One is um, have less of us, less people. So a population question, which often comes up in these discussions. And also, should we be eating pests? 
So there is a bit of a movement on, certainly in Tasmania, um, where we eat the problem and they're coming up with innovative ways of eating invasive species as a way to reduce impact. Have you got any comments on that? Well, happy if you don't eat pests, uh, go, go nuts, uh, <laughs> definitely. And, you know, it, it's interesting. I, this is, it's, it's hard with some of those things because it's interesting that, that kangaroo has a much smaller carbon footprint than beef and lamb. It's interesting that it's a red meat with a lower footprint, but obviously there are other issues involved in the, the killing of that. So it's not, it's not a total solution in, in overall. Uh, to come to the population question, <clears throat> it's, look, population's a factor, but it's not, the major factor and I'd say the reason for that is if you look at it that if you look at something like Indonesia that has a massive population that they, they're you know carbon footprint per person is about a tenth of ours it's more about our lifestyle and the way in which we're living that is creating the problem here so 20 million people using some green power has much less of an effect than 5 million people using coal it, you know, it's obviously there are some things that are exacerbated through population, but that's depends on the lifestyle of those population. It depends on, how, you know, how much goods they're using, how those goods are created, how much energy they're using, how the energy is created. So it's not, I just, yeah, look, population is not, I think, the solution here. I think it can, I know it, it's a very popular kind of 1970s analysis of this problem, but I don't think it's the correct analysis for the problem we face right now. Mm. I don't know, Richie, what do you think on that? Like, what's your view on the, the, on the, the population thing? Because, you know, it, I'm not saying it has no factor, but it tends to be the, yeah, it tends to be looked at as the major solution. And it's probably not really going to be a solution. But it, it, and also, it's not a solution that's within our control unless we're, you know, a government like China and, and decide to put you know, mm. policies in place to limit children. Or if we're like Josh Frydenberg and we're recommending people have more babies for the country. Like, unless you're taking a position in this space, like, it's not immediately up to yeah. you. Some people it's a, it's a lot easier to, to make it every, every bit of energy in Australia renewable than it is to tell everyone to not have kids. Yeah. I mean, we can barely get people to wear freaking masks during a pandemic, let alone tell them not to have kids. So, uh, good luck. It, it, it's, it, it's interesting. Like, I know a number of people at, um, yeah, around my age who are at the stage where they're having children are considering whether that whether that's part of the climate contribution and i think it's a personal choice that everyone has to come to that in, in the same way that they choose other ways that they live their life and what their contribution is going to be the way i personally see it uh yeah i've got two little kids but i'm raising them up to be climate warriors yeah i'm raising them up to to, to be ready to fight the fight um and it so it really depends on on how you want to engage in this space rather than any one prescriptive solution to to this mm. Yeah. Yeah. Would it be would it be okay to go back to the question now around because there are a lot of questions. The lobbying Actually question. there's two parts to it. One is Craig, when are you going to run to be a politician and why aren't you already one? Um a few people have asked that. And then the other part of the question is how do people actually effectively lobby for change? I'm not 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 everybody can I loved it by the way when you chased the Prime Minister with the balloons attached to your back. I thought that was fab. But um those two questions. I would suggest, by the way, that uh, chasing a, a politician with balloons or a large ball covered in plastic bags is actually not a very good way to lobby. I'd say it's probably counterproductive in some ways. So don't look to that as a solution there. Um, yeah, look, it's a really interesting one. And I'm actually working on a documentary at the moment that looks at the effect of money and lobbying and politics. And I think that <clears throat> you can't really understand Australia's climate policy over the last period, you know, 10, 20 years without understanding that as a factor. Although I don't think it's the only factor. Like I think it's also, there's been some, there's a, it's a bit more complex than that, but it's definitely been a major factor involved in that. And <clears throat> I think that, I think that part of that is to recognize that yes, politicians have gas executives or whatever or donors in their ears, but they're also very sensitive to the community. And it actually goes back to that first question from Richie, is that I think if people see polling that says 85% of Australians think climate's a problem and they want something done about it, 
but then they're getting very few letters coming through their post box rather than <clears throat> just from a small proportion of the electorate. And when it push comes to shove, they're like, nah, these people, when you push them on it, they're like, yeah, we should do something about the climate. Oh, I'm not going to give up my V8. You know, that kind of thing. If that politicians are getting that kind of feedback, they're like, okay, this is, there's a bit more nuance to this, you know, to this debate. And it's not as demanding as it seems to be. So <clears throat> what I think is important is for people to be in touch with their politicians in a polite manner, to be honest, and sort of kind of saying to them, like, you know, if, 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 if a politician's getting lots of letters from people in their constituency saying, hi, I really would love to have an electric car, you know, but there's just no infrastructure here. You know, every letter is taken as the view of 10, 20, 100 people, you know, that kind of thing of, there's, you know, I think there's a very important role for, you know, you know, uh, uh, protests and extinction rebellion and that kind of stuff. But there's also a role for other people who are not going to do that kind of thing, who may well be liberal voters. Good on you. That's fine. There's many, many people who are liberal voters who are concerned about the climate, who should be trying to kind of change the debate within their own party as well. And that can be done with polite letters or discussions or going along to meetings and talking to people. <clears throat> I think that we need that that kind of lobbying coming from the community happening on all different levels, to be honest. So that the, the, the kind of, you know, if you're getting the lobbying coming from the, the, the fossil fuel sector over here, and obviously they're big donors, it's hard to compete on that level. But if you're getting the lobbying from the other parts of the community, and it feels like it's not just the extremists, it's, it's this part of the community as well. And so oh, I got a lovely letter from an old lady who wants, is concerned about her grandkids' future as well. If it's coming from all those things, Politicians are attuned to that and they won't all respond. There's, uh, you know, I can't see Matt Canavan changing next week, but there are a lot of people who will respond to that. So I think you need to recognise that uh, lobbying, the power of the community to also lobby in a sense is, is, is a real thing. Hmm. And your own um, political aspirations, given that we've got oh, a lot no. of questions on it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, 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 I have followed politicians and politics for too many years to think I should go into politics. <laughs> I sometimes feel for them. I don't. I'm one of the few people in Australia that sometimes feels for politicians. Uh, yeah. And, and, and this, about... is, this is actually, to be, to, to be fair, this is an interesting thing. Like, this is, goes back again to one of the reasons why it's important to have the population pushing for change because it was interesting. I came from a kind of political science background and I think I went into war and waste with a very old fashioned view of power. Like, you know, you just lobby the politician and they change the rules and it all fixes. And in actual fact, the change that tend to come after the War and Waste show tend to be more bottom up. It tend to start from the public and then it would permeate the councils and then might have gone to state government. And the federal government was kind of the last to respond. And I think similarly with this is, you know, the climate needs more of that. Climate change also needs more of that. Not, not to say it hasn't happened. I mean, there's been enormous amounts of really important and fantastic you know, civil action happening in Australia for many years. I'm not saying it's started, but it just needs more of it to put that pressure on politicians. I had politicians saying to me, we don't lead, we follow. And that's something to, to remember. You don't often see that on their bumper sticker around election time. No, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Your MP following you. Um, yeah. And do you have plans, a few other questions, um, around what you've got. Are you going to take planet, um, Fight for Planet A further? What, some people, um, I think it's Steve, Steve is asking if you are considering making board games from it, but I guess in general, the, <laughs> I think okay. that would be like I have Pokemon, not had that except for the family climate something change. something like this and getting a new question. That's great, board games. Uh, <laughs> so yes, I would love to take Fight for, climate, for Planet A further. There were things that we didn't get to. I think that in terms of the stuff I wanted to cover in that show, we didn't get to a lot of things. And for instance, we particularly didn't get to, I guess, your financial footprint and, you know, your superannuation, your banking and all that kind of stuff. We did, we did kind of look into it, but unfortunately didn't quite get it there. I think in the end, the, we ended up spending a lot more time on the kind of simple stuff of what is climate change? Where does it come from? What is its effect? than we thought we would. So I guess we didn't get as much. So I'd love to do a second series and we'll see what happens. Uh, that's, see what happens on that front. As for board games, I have not thought of that yet. If, if you know, a board game based recovery, maybe. 
Well, there is someone asking actually if you're going to make this into a DVD. I didn't. I didn't know that you still that DVDs were still made. But... No one makes DVDs. There's a book coming out. In, I will be putting out a book in November. Uh, DVDs. I don't know about DVDs. You can watch it on iView, guys, uh, for, mm. for, the, for the foreseeable future. <laughs> I, you know, I'm with you. I love a good DVD, but uh, tell me, no one's got a DVD player anymore. Mm. Uh, Craig, on in terms of personal action or, or political action or political influence, one thing that you were able to cover at the very start of the first episode with the school climate strikes. Um, what are your thoughts around that kind of political engagement and how to maybe turn that or manifest that into an actual direct impact? And I think, for example, of like the seat of Warringah going from Tony Abbott as the representative to Zali Stegall, where you couldn't be any more different in terms of their climate leadership. Yeah, look, I think that the student strike movement and the student campaigns has been a crucial part of changing the debate to be honest i think it's been really fantastic uh it's such a great movement and i think it has one where it's interesting i think it's it's a movement where at times it's gotten through to different generations in a way that might not have if it was somebody from their own generation speaking uh, it was interesting going to that climate change um march in sydney we were trying to film it and at times we were like, I can't see a bloody student anywhere. <laughs> there was just so many parents and grandparents and people came down from their offices and joined in. And it's, uh, it's really important that I think it's important that that movement doesn't get taken over on that day. It felt like it was a lot of adult movements trying to take over the student movement. I think it's really important that doesn't happen. I think it's really important that that movement maintains student leadership and a student voice because <clears throat> that's what's made it so effective. Um, in terms of the, look, I think that that has an effect at so many levels, you know, it's a, it's a filtering level. It's really complex the way mm. the power works. I mean, Zali Stegall was a, it was a fascinating campaign, I guess, because it, what's interesting about it though, is that <clears throat> firstly, Zali's, I think there's a, there's an incorrect analysis of the last election because it was framed as a climate change election. And because the Liberal Party then won, it's been framed as if the climate change stuff was not important. If you actually look at a lot of conservative seats and city seats, they actually did uh, go toward away from <clears throat> conservative parties. And I think that the climate change was a very big part of that. Tony Abbott's seat was probably one of the only ones that really flipped, but that's because yeah. he had, there were <laughs> there were extra reasons why he may not have been <laughs> particularly loved. Uh, will be how I put that. Um, but yeah, I think that it is. I think that both Liberal and Labor parties would be foolish to misinterpret the last election and to not understand how much passion there is in the community and to not really be adapting to that. And again, this is it. Like it's not a, it's not a bloody, in so many countries around the world, it's not a partisan issue. It's not a left right issue. It's not a conservative labor issue. Unfortunately, in Australia, it's become that it was, it was kind of weaponized by Tony Abbott <clears throat> around climate tax and it's become that, but it's no, but not by nature that. I mean, we saw Trent Zimmerman the other day kind of responding to Malcolm Roberts about his idiocy and defending climate change action. It's, I think we need to get it back to that, that level. And that's why I say, you know, you don't have to be Extinction Rebellion. You, if you're a member of the Liberal Party, go to your local branch meeting and try to change that internal politics that's going on there, because that's a very important part about it as well. Um, yeah, so look, I, yeah. Yep. Maybe someone could suggest that Matt Canavan joined Tony Abbott in his trade mission for the UK. That would be a... Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, been, that's been important work for coal. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the interesting things. Have you noticed that, like, it's interesting that uh, even now there's very few people in the federal government level really pushing coal. It's kind of like if you're a fossil fuel cheer squad, you're really pushing gas now. Even there, you've moved on from coal. It's, you know, you have to, it's so foolish to make the argument to build a new coal-fired power station that it falls upon very few people to make that argument. It's a, it's a tough sell, a new coal-fired power station, even if you pay for the proposal as the federal government is finding. I mean, we, we, if you look at the national electricity market in 2018 and 2019, there were more breakdowns in the newest coal-fired power stations in Queensland Per unit of energy than the older ones so it's not even that the new ones are more reliable uh, they're more expensive and they're more high polluting so it's a tough it's a tough sell uh, which is why I think 
um, if the market is left to it, it won't build any more coal-fired power stations in this country. Mm, absolutely. You talk about whether you could do a sequel for the show or whether it goes to DVD or, um, or, or a whole variety of other ways. But what is unique is that it doesn't seem like a lot of these stories are being told, um, whereas we've had decades of being told that Australia um, derives a good amount of its wealth from the resources that it extracts and the need to protect those resources. And Paul after Paul showed that people often overestimate the number of jobs or the amount of income mm. coal mining, gas mining bring to Australia. Like, what do you think we need to do to, to tackle that lack of information around the resources mm. sector and the role that it plays um, and the broader impacts it has? Um, and is that maybe the space for a sequel? Yeah, well, if, interestingly enough, it, it, it's, uh, I think it's on the iView website. We did have a great chat with... Uh, some people in uh, Victoria <clears throat> who had lost their jobs when coal-fired power station had closed down there. And it's fascinating to see a lot of, some of them were working in renewable energy, but even those that weren't, it was really a fascinating chat because they were kind of also going, we don't understand why the government hasn't moved to the next step. They're kind of saying a lot of the infrastructure that's here that's, that was used for coal can be used for the next step. You know, there's a lot of people in that industry, they're engineers, they're actually equally frustrated by the lack of government action as others. And I think this is the important thing to recognise. I don't think, despite the rhetoric, I don't think that the protection of coal is necessarily about protecting the jobs of the workers and the plants and the mines. I think uh, a lot of the time it's about protecting the bigger industry and some politics behind that. I think the reality is that <clears throat> the sooner we get on to trying to help those people transition to the jobs that are going to have a longer lifespan, the better. Because what you saw when the Hazelwood power station shut down was it was that kind of surprise. They hadn't been <clears throat> preparing for it. Um, and the actual the transition was done really well by Victoria, but we need to be far more prepared for this. We need to be kind of really, I don't want anybody, I, I don't think people who work in coal power, fire power stations or, or coal mines should be in any way bearing the brunt of this change. It's not their fault. They, you know, they are working in an industry that we gave a lot of prominence to and we, you know, we did benefit from. But now that we know what we do, we have to make that transition and they shouldn't be bearing the, the, the pain of that. That's where you need a government that's actually being proactive and saying, okay, we're going to create jobs in those areas for those people. We're going to transition them into those jobs because, you know, they shouldn't be left to um, holding the can for this. Well, the Australia Institute's done a lot of work over the years, you know, not just on back of envelopes, on around the amount of people that are actually employed in the coal industry. And it's it, it, it's a very, very minor industry and it's shrinking. And that's not taking away from those individuals with those jobs. Every Every job is important to the person who holds it. But as a policy driver, it's a very small part of the employment market. Um, and I think absolutely, I agree with you, it's used uh, as a weapon rather than a genuine concern. Um, you know, if it was a genuine concern for people losing their jobs, you don't get that same sort of outcry when, you know, 5,000 people from the finance industry were sacked in in the mid-90s or, you know, the things that are going on now. That's fair because that's the there. finance industry. That's fine. Yeah, I know. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, we've got, just thinking around the... Um, the um, student strikes, we've actually got quite a few young people coming in with questions. And just to say again, I'm just really um, thrilled how many people have come on to this webinar. I mean, we've got, um, at the moment, we're still on two and a half thousand. I think we spiked at nearly 3,000 about 20 minutes ago. So I don't know what we started talking about 20 minutes ago, but we, we lost a couple. <laughs> Maybe it that was just, it was just cup of time. But it's an <laughs> extraordinary amount of people coming on. And they're from all across the country. We've got people um, in Queensland, uh, Western Australia, basically all the states. I can't see anywhere where we, we, we haven't got coverage. Um, and some, I just want to go to a couple of the questions from the younger folk. Uh, we've got Edith, who's seven years old, and she thinks electric cars cost too much. And yes, that, I agree. Um, <laughs> I love it. That, 
can't remember that Edith can't drive for another 11 years, but she's already got her eye on the prize. You'd, you'd uh, be surprised how many like 10 year olds love Teslas. Uh, no, no, but this is it again, because that's the problem is in Australia, we have very little supply and we have no nothing actually promoting it or, or cutting that price down. So again, it requires yeah. government action, not the discussion paper. The, yeah. Uh, another one, another, um, I can't, I think actually this is an anonymous um, participant, um, but they're wanting to know if uh, you think that this type of thing, Planet A type uh, programs should be part of the education curriculum. Oh, look, I hope so. I, I hope it gets shown in schools. That'd be great. I think um, it's uh, I, the best part about doing the war on waste is how many kids came up to me on the street and said, we watched it at school and we're doing this at the school or we're doing this at home or I have some of my parents and now we're doing this. So yeah. absolutely, I, I, I hope they do watch it in the schools because um, unfortunately we're leaving most of the work to them. Mm. Um, a few young people are asking about civil disobedience, which you touched on a little bit with your um, thinking balloons is not the way to go. But I guess more generally, um, the question, there's a few of them, and the question, question centres on what do you f feel about civil disobedience as a tool for change? I think it's an important part of change. Um, as I said, <clears throat> you know, we need, we need pressure on an enormous amount of levels at the moment. Um, it needs to be coming from, you know, Extinction Rebellion, it needs to come from civil disobedience, it needs to come from the boardrooms of Australia. And we, we are seeing some businesses where you're doing that and leading as well. So we really genuinely need that pressure to come from so many places at the moment. Uh, you know, we have a very, the power in Australia is very fractured and it needs to be very clear that it's a very strong majority of people that think that we've left this too late. We need change now to actually get that kind of change. Because unfortunately, there's a, you know, there's a, it's a strong vested interest in Australia to push back the other way. Did you get much public pushback on Planet A, like either in the streets when you were filming or subsequent to its release? No, a lot less than I thought. And it's interesting as well that the kind of pushback that did come from, you know, Sky News or whatever oh. was of a kind of, it was interesting to see. I think that the debate has slightly changed. It's interesting that even some of the more extreme climate denialists of probably five years ago in the kind of national debate have started to backtrack from that position and have tried to stay, take on a different type of position. I think the evidence is overwhelming. The sentiment is overwhelming and that's why we need, the problem is we just need, we need real action now. I mean, we can't be, we cannot be investing in gas right now. We need to be investing in the kind of battery storage and the kind of pumped hydro and that kind of thing, which can make our grid be able to handle far more re renewable energy as we move forward. We should be investing that right now. And mm. unfortunately, every bit of delay to that just pushes it down the road. Mm. Richie, do you have anything you want to say? You're on, no, we you're on mute, Richie. There we go. Thanks, Craig, the, the line of the century. Uh, the cost of climate inaction. Um, we saw that potentially a hundred billion dollar cost in the last summer, the black um, summer bushfires. We're seeing this in terms of the summer of disasters Queensland had with floods. Um, with, we're seeing this with the hailstorms, with a whole variety of climate impacts. We're, we're proposing a fossil fuel production levy, a dollar for every ton of embedded emissions in the coal and gas that Australia mines. Uh, and producers, like how do we find ways to cover the mounting bill that is climate inaction? Absolutely, I think that's a good idea because the reality is that what we're doing now and talking about the younger generation is what we're doing right now is if, <clears throat> if you have a fossil fuel company that digs up coal or gas, exports it and makes money and doesn't pay for the carbon emissions involved in that, what you are doing is passing the bill of that onto the next generation. You are passing that on to your kids. That's a massive bill. So if they're not paying for either getting rid of the emissions or paying for dealing with the kind of the change that will occur and the problems that are created by that, then you're just passing it on to the next generation. And you're essentially getting, I mean, the you're getting Chevron shareholders are getting a massive kickback from the next generation, from the children who will take over. And that is, as they say in the classics, bullshit. 
Okay, well, that brings us just about to time. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. So I'd like to thank Richie and also Craig and everyone, the thousands of people who joined us today and all of their great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. I tried to pick out the, the themes that were coming through the most. Um, next week, we've got Catherine Murphy for our um, next economics of pandemic webinar and she'll be talking about the end of uh, Scott Morrison and the end of certainty that's in conversation with our executive director Ben Oquist. Um, until then everybody stay 1.5 meters apart stay connected stay safe and thanks again for coming see you later thanks everyone thanks Craig Appreciate thanks, it. Richie. Thanks. Bye. thanks bye see you. Oh.